So praise the Lord. So today we're, we're going to look at four components that I believe that should impact our relationship with God. Because we're going to talk about relationships and impact on this. This is good grace that we have, amen. And we're going to learn how to use it, not abuse it. Okay? So we, so we can understand that as we take a look at it this morning. Matter of fact, we, we read today here in your introduction that you have. Read along with me. Over the last several weeks, we've been examining the difference between good grace and bad grace. Grace is not the freedom to serve no master, but a new master. Grace does not mean that we are under no law, but under a new law. Over the next few weeks, we will discover how a proper understanding of grace should impact our relationships, our marriages, our church. And so today we're going to be looking at the grace that should affect the most important relationship, and that is our relationship with God. So I trust as we take a good look at this this morning, we'll think about it. Now this good grace ought to impact our understanding of sin. I think today a lot of believers that claim to be saving of believers in the way they're living and acting really don't have an understanding uh, of God's grace on the thing of this matter called sin. Grace doesn't give us a license to go out and sin more. The Bible says, what, shall we sin more that grace may abound? No, God forbid, may that never be. But yet this is what I see happening and going on. And you see, we're not going to understand it until we have a clear understanding of it. That's why the writer put in Hebrews, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened, talking about a hardened heart, through the deceitfulness of sin. And I think that's what's happening with a lot of the believers today because they don't understand because, you see, they're, they're focusing more on this what we call bad grace or cheap grace that we have a liberty and a license to just to do in anything we want to do, whatever. Yes, you do. Okay, let me just stop right there. You do. You do have a choice that you can make. You can take this grace of God's, and yeah, you can live the way you want to, act the way you want to, and go on and on. But let me tell you something. There are consequences to that. And those consequences can be severe. They can be hard. They can be hard, harsh. But there are consequences to the decisions and choices we make. And we need to understand that. And the reason why so many today are just out here living the way they want to and a license and, you know, you go up and talk to them and they pull out their card out of their pocket and here's their grace card. So carte blanche, get out of jail free, get out of sin free. Or here, after all, I can sin anyway because it doesn't matter. I'm under grace and not under the law, preacher. And by the way, it's God's job to forgive me. Folks, you need to get that kind of thinking out of your mind. I mean, that, that, that's wrong thinking. That's, that's incorrect thinking. It's what we call stinky thinking. Okay, so, we, so the good grace will help you and I to understand, uh, to have an understanding of sin. And I think one of the first things to see with this, this bad grace that we're talking about, this cheap grace, what it does, remember he said the hardness of deceitfulness of sin, it's going to cause you to be deceived about even the very nature of God. Cheap grace, bad grace will cause you to be deceived about the very nature of God. Everybody with me? Say amen. amen. By the way, just a little footnote here for you. Good grace leads us towards God. Bad, cheap grace leads us further away from God. So there's something you can remember, all right, to help you out a little bit, okay? See, we use grace today to sin against the King of glory. Did you know that? That's what people are doing today with that type of attitude and thinking that we can use this grace, bad grace, to sin against the king of glory? Why in the world, C.J., and he don't mind me calling, I guess Clark Kent today. And, and so why in the world, you should have seen him here the other day, man. He leaped into the attic with a single bound. <laughs> Becky had to climb the steps, but he was already there. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. But I caution both of them, please, be very careful going up and down those stairs. I said, you see that top, Miss Becky? You see that bottom? That's where I landed. That's what caused this, all right? <laughs> so be very, very careful, please. Praise God, amen. amen. Listen, now, you tell, we don't, the, the cheap grace will deceive you in understanding the very nature of God. The good grace will help us to understand that nature of God. Go back to Genesis. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 in God's creation. You remember the story of Adam and Eve? You remember what took place in the garden and what happened? And if you read that story again, you ought to read it two or three times, you're going to see how Eve messed up pretty badly. She once, once, she misquoted the Scripture, and secondly, she added to the Word of God. 
Hello? Don't add to the Word of God. In Genesis chapter 3, and verse 4 and 5, you see, here's what cheap grace tells us. Cheap grace doesn't understand and will deceive us about the very nature of God, because after all, we can go out and sin. We're under grace. It's a good thing. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now, now what do you think about that right there? What did God tell her? He said, The day you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. That's what God said. The devil comes along and twists us the word of God through the deceitfulness. Because you see, the, the, the fruit she lusted after, and God didn't say the fruit trees either. Amen. Eve did. God said you can eat of every tree of the garden except the tree of good and evil. Amen. She told the devil that God said we can eat of all the fruit trees. God didn't say that. And the devil says, you're surely, you're not going to die. I mean, after all, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, but let me tell you something. First of all, all sin against God is contempt to God. All sin. And secondly, God doesn't want any competition. But see, that's not, what the, that's not what the Word said. See, she, mis she misquoted it. He misquoted it. The devil did you see, you got to understand that. And through the deceitfulness of the lust, because it looked good to the eye, pleasant to the eye, the lust to the eye, he deceived her through the deceitfulness of lust because she didn't understand and have a good comprehension and understanding of the very nature of God when it comes to uh, sin. God doesn't permit us to go out and sin and have a good time. No, God made it very clear. If you eat that tree, you're going to die. And she did, and she died spiritually. There was a separation because death separates us from God. Sin separates us from fellowship with God if you're saved. The Bible says a soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. It shall. That's a promise of God. The Bible says when sin conceiveth and finisheth, then it bringeth forth death. When it's finished with you and I, it's going to bring forth death. Okay? The wages of sin is death. So see, there is a price and a penalty to pay for sin. See, that's what God says. But the devil says, no, not at all. Use your grace card to go out and sin all you want to. Because, see, that doesn't matter to God. You're not going to die. No, the Bible says you're already dead in trespasses and sin. You understand that? Now, I know you've already left me. Stay with me. You need this. You come here, you're going to hear the truth. You're going to hear the Scripture. It might make you feel a little uncomfortable. Praise God, that's the Holy Spirit. You might even come under conviction. Bless God, that's the Holy Spirit's job. He convicts of sin. That's what it's all about. But you see, the devil lied to her. He tricked her. He deceived her because that's his name, Satan, the great deceiver. You see, because she didn't understand what God said, what God said he meant. She died. She died spiritually, and then you're going to die physically. Did you know they were created to live for eternity? That's why you see, ladies and gentlemen, when you die, you think, well, you're dead and gone. No, 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 my friend. The only thing that dies is this earthly tabernacle. This body, this only earthly tent that I live in, is the only thing that died and get laid in the grave. But the body and the soul is going to live forever, for all eternity. The question is just where you're going to live. You're going to live in heaven in glory with God, or you're going to live in hell with the devil and his group. Oh, preacher, don't you stand up and tell me I'm going to go to hell. I'm not telling you you're going to go to hell, but I'm telling you you will go if you go without Christ. If you die lost in your sin, you will spend an eternity in hell with the devil. Now, you all think this is easy. This is hard to preach like this because I know this isn't popular preaching. I don't gain no points with this. I don't get no higher ratings on the Nelson ratings than the Arbitron ratings. Matter of fact, they go down. But oh, my friend, no, no, that's what happens. So that you become deceived about the very nature of God. There's no sin in him. He doesn't allow it. He doesn't tolerate it. He doesn't put up with it. He doesn't go along with it. He doesn't approve it. So get off your bad, cheap grace and quit using it. Quit misusing it. Misusing it. Quit distorting it. And quit perverting it. And when I talk about perversion, I'm talking about all these people that claim to be saved, who claim to have experienced and have been a recipient of the grace of God that are out here living in immorality. God still says it's wrong. God still says it's a sin. God says thou shalt not commit. Well, I've got my grace card. 
I'll just pop, flash my grace card. Sorry, that doesn't work, you see. So the people are deceived in this cheap, bad grace about the very nature of God. And secondly, they're deceived about the very nature of sin itself. Listen to what Hebrews 3.13 says. But exhort one another daily, it's in your notes, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You see, and when we get to, and the thing with that, and with the devil, I'll go back with that, and it's the same thing here. You know what the devil did to Eve? Just what he does with all these people with cheap grace. He tells her, God, God wants you to be happy. God doesn't want to keep anything from you. He doesn't want you not to eat of this wonderful fruit. He, you know, he, he's not wanting to keep anything from you. You got to understand that. And then you buy that hook, line, and sinker. Then when he comes being deceived about the very nature of sin, isn't that what the devil tells us today? Oh, man, you, you, you can have a blast. You can have a ball. This is good. And, 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 and God isn't going to keep all these things from you. He wants you to have fun. He wants you to enjoy life. He does. He even says that sin is for a pleasure for a time. Amen. And you know what the devil does? He does the same thing. He comes along to these, those that want to use their grace card for license to sin and live in sin and so forth. He comes along and, he's, and he makes it toasty. We don't have an understanding of the very nature of sin. So what's the devil do? He comes along to see Jane. He says, ah, he uses the television. Uh oh, the preacher's going to meddling. No, I'm not going to meddling. I'm telling you the truth. There's nothing but any more, almost nothing but trash and garbage on the boob tube. And the devil uses that. And he uses it so much, he tells it to get you a smart TV. He uses it so much to tell you, you need a, you need a 4K 5G TV. You need to have about 400 million pixels so that it's so sharp and clear so you can really get enticed into your sin and love your pornography and your garbage. He uses the Internet today to get a hold of us and to entice us on the Internet, especially in the area of immorality and pornography today. It is so easy. See, that's the trick of the devil. Oh, you see, he tells you to tell you, hey, they don't have to worry about sin. You're under the grace. You're not under law anymore. So he uses magazines. They're in everywhere you store you go. Where do they put them? Right in front of the cash register. They're going to put them right up there where you can see them. And so he uses everything and tries to deceive you of these things. Proverbs put it this way, King Solomon. He says, For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. You see, you're deceived about the very nature of sin. You need to have, see, but good grace, you see, is going to give you and I a better clearing and a better understanding of the understanding of sin, understanding of God's nature of sin, how he feels about it, and understanding the nature of sin and how he feels about it, not being deceived. So that's good grace. That's the first component. We're going to look at four components of good grace that gives us a better understanding rather than what's being taught today and going on. The second, number two, God's grace impacts our understanding of repentance. Can you all agree we all sin? Amen. And we've all been forgiven, amen? amen. How many believe you've been forgiven? How many believe you're all forgiven past, present, and future? Now, for all of you here sitting here today, all of your sins have been forgiven future. Because, you see, when Jesus died 2,000 years ago, you weren't even born yet. So all your sin was future. You hadn't even come on the scene yet. Hello. See, when Jesus died on the cross, all your sin, all your sin was forgiven. Past, present, and future. And you weren't even born yet. So that was all future for us, all right? Are you good with there? There you go. Amen. So Jesus died for all of our sin, past, present, and future. It's fantastic. See, Colossians 2.13, And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. How much? All. So you see, here's the theory today. Well, then see there, I got you, preacher. If all my sins are forgiven, and they were all forgiven 2,000 years ago, then it doesn't really matter how I live and what I do today, because it's already forgiven. So I pull out my grace card. I have a license to freedom to go out and live how I want, sin if I want, because after all, it's all forgiven. 
And if not, it's God's job to forgive me anyway, right? Well, you need to understand something. There are two types of forgiveness. When you got saved, the moment you got saved and trusted Christ as your Savior, all of your sin, past, present, and future. So if you just got saved yesterday, okay, so all your past sins are forgiven. If you got saved yesterday and you sinned yesterday and today, your present sin's forgiven. And tomorrow you're going to sin, so your future sin's already forgiven. Amen? So someone says, well, then why do I need to ask God for forgiveness? Well, first of all, let me tell you, when you got saved and all your past, present sin was saved, that was what we call judicial forgiveness. You were, you were forgiven immediately, judicially. See, isn't that what Paul said? We'll take a look at it in just a minute. See, judicial forgiveness is a one-time act the moment you get saved. But then secondly, we have a relationship with God now. He is our Father. I am a son. You are a daughter. So now you see, CJ, I have that father and son relationship. Amen? But when sin enters in and I'm living and wallowing in sin, it breaks, it puts a wall up between that relationship. Now I haven't lost my salvation. I haven't fallen from grace because I'm still a son. He doesn't kick me out. He doesn't throw me out of my salvation and tell me I've lost from grace and I don't have it anymore and I've got to get saved over and over and over again. You see, that's Tommy Rod. He doesn't change my name because I am still his son. But there has been a barrier put up, a wall put up, a separation because sin separates us from God. The Bible said if we regard iniquity in our heart, God doesn't hear us and he hides his face from us. Okay, our sin in 1 John, 1 John 1, 7 through 10, he talks about we break that fellowship. Therefore, you see, I need to ask for forgiveness to restore the fellowship with my father. It's just like with you and your dad and your sons and daughters. You're the dad, you're the papa. The son or the daughter has really, really done some good stuff and bad stuff, and, you, <laughs> and you're not very pleased and happy. There's a kind of a wall there, a barrier between you and that child until there's forgiveness. When that child comes back and says, Dad, I messed up, I was wrong, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. You know what? That relationship is brought right back into that wonderful relationship. But CJ, just because that happened, he didn't throw the son out. He didn't change his name. He's no longer mine. He's going to get him a new name. No. So we call it parental, parental forgiveness. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, being justified, that's a one-time act, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's judicial forgiveness. Are you with me? Amen? Amen. Okay, that took place. That's judicial. Past, present, and future. All taken care of. But along the way, you know, I have some problems. Every now and then, I sin. You say, you sin, preacher? Yeah, and so do you. There's no sinless person in this auditorium. There's no sinless person watching by Rumble, Facebook, television, radio. There's no sinful, sinless person. There's no such thing as sinless perfection. There is none righteous, no, not one. We've all become unprofitable servants and gone out of our way. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3. So we all struggle with that. So have I lost my salvation? Have I fallen from grace? No. But my relationship has been, a barrier has gone up, has been broken. Because the Lord cannot have fellowship with sin. He's holy and righteous. Amen. Let's take a look at it. Turn to 1 John here. You got it there in your notes, but I want you to see another verse in here as well. Get over to 1 John chapter 1 with me right quick. Let the Lord of God explain this a little bit better to us, all right? John here, the Apostle John, he wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and he's the writer of the book of the Revelation. And John's writing to believers. Can you say that with me? He's writing to believers, okay? Well, let's see what he has to say about writing to believers concerning this parental forgiveness. All right, everybody ready? Here we go. Verse 6. Let's start with verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him. And we declare unto you that God is light, 
And in him is no darkness at all. Are you getting this? Verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him. How many of you got fellowship with him? How many of you say you have fellowship with him? Okay. And we walk in darkness, which verse 5 just told us there's no darkness in him. We lie and do not the truth. Amen. Hello. Amen. But, here's a conjunction, here's a contrast. If we walk in the light, because verse 5 said he is the light, we have what? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then what happens? We have fellowship one with another. That's fellowship with Christ. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. See, there's that parental forgiveness. We're talking about a relationship. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, see, John's talking about sins of the believer. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Verse 9, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Did everybody understand that? I think the scripture makes it very clear. So you see, there's parental, parental forgiveness. That's why we need to ask the Lord for forgiveness on a daily basis for some of us. For some of us, it might be on an hourly basis. Hello, I see some of you laughing and smiling, so I've hit a button here. So let's stay on the button a little bit. Amen? Huh? You know what I'm talking about, church. And so what do we do? We confess that sin or sins. And God does what? He is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us. Because why? He wants to restore the fellowship that's been broken because of the iniquity, the sin, the lawlessness that's in our lives. Now notice he said confess, confess, confess. Now here's where we're going to get some of us. Confession is different than repentance. Hello? Amen. Confession is just God, I'm sorry I got caught. Yes, God, I'm sorry for doing that. I was wrong. I admit it. I agree. Will you forgive me? And he does, does he not? We just read it. It says that he does. That's confession. But you see, we're trying to have an understanding of repentance. Going back to number two, all right? See, good grace is going to give you and I an understanding of genuine repentance. Are you with me? Say amen. All right, the meaning of repentance it means to change one's mind, which leads to a change of direction. You don't have it, write it down, okay? The meaning of repentance, it means to change one's mind, which leads to a change of direction. To change one's mind, which leads to a change of direction. We're talking about repentance here now, not confession. There are two components repentance has. The first one is a change of attitude. You need and I need to have a change of attitude. We need to have the right attitude. We need to admit our sin. We need to admit our wrong, our mistake, etc. And then we ought to have a humble attitude about it. That's the first component. You got to get to a place of that. Then the second component is a change of direction. Means, that means a turnaround. You're going in one direction, you're going to turn around 180 degrees opposite and go in the opposite direction. Are you with me? We're to turn around from it. We're not to continue to live in it anymore or to do it anymore. We're to live unto God. Now, a lot of people keep doing the same thing over and over again and you keep asking for forgiveness over and over again, you keep confessing it over and over again, and that's fine, but you haven't repented. Because you haven't had a change of mind. You haven't turned from it and turned away from it. See, we turn from sin and we turn to God. We turn from the world and the things and everything in the world, everything we got doing and getting on, and we turn to a life consecrated, 
separated, dedicated life to Christ of holiness. But if we just keep going back and doing it over and over again, you haven't repented of it. See, and that's the problem we have today. Well, I don't have to because I was forgiven 2,000 years ago. That's judicial forgiveness. But you got parental forgiveness. And by the way, respectfully, Daddy has given us a lot of stuff in here. A lot of commands and a lot of stuff that he expects us to obey and, and, and do. And yet we don't do them. 1 Corinthians, Paul put it this way. Then we'll go to 1 Peter real quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 through 20. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? What is your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? And notice where he's at. Which is in you. Which you have of God. And you are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So you're going to have a hard time glorifying God in your body if you keep continually doing it over and over again. Because you haven't repented. Turn to 1 Peter with me. Just back a couple of pages from John there. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. You write this down, you don't have it. 1 Peter chapter 1. All right, when he said we're bought with a price. Well, let's just see what kind of price we were bought with. Everybody in 1 Peter 1? That's just a couple of pages back from where we were. All right, here we go. Verse 18. Peter says, for as much as ye know. All right, in other words, Peter says we know something. What do we know? That we were not redeemed, we were not purchased, we were not bought. That's what the word means. With corruptible things. What are corruptible things? Silver, gold, and your vain conversation. That's your manner of living, your lifestyle, received by the traditions of your fathers. Verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So you were purchased with the blood of Christ. That's what we were purchased with. We're not our own. We don't have a, well, I don't, but maybe some of you may, and I hope not. You don't have a grace card in your pocket. Well, I can go out and do this, because after all, I'm under grace. Yeah, but let me remind you, that grace you have came at a very high cost. God says, you don't belong to you anymore. When you got saved, you gave up your rights. Stop going around here and think, well, I got rights. I got rights. You know, everybody's got, I got my rights. I got my rights. No, as a believer, you don't have no rights. You yielded and gave up your rights when you got saved because you're not your own. You have a new master under grace, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he paid for that with his precious blood so that you and I wouldn't go out and continue to keep living in sin and pull out our grace card and use it as a license to sin and live the way we want, act the way we want. You can, yes, you can. You have every right to do that. You have the free will. But I'm telling you, there will be severe consequences that will come with it. Mm, my. I must hurry. Thirdly, Good grace impacts our understanding of obedience. Everybody with me? It impacts our understanding of sin. It impacts our understanding of repentance. And it impacts our understanding of obedience. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace, there we are again, are you what? Saved. Saved how? Through faith. See, you're, through your faith, you receive the most precious, amazing gift that God could give to you, grace. You couldn't earn it. You couldn't buy it. You couldn't work for it. You couldn't merit it. God gave it to you because you didn't deserve it. Through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is what is? The gift of what is? The gift of God. Grace. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, don't take. Now, here we go. Here goes our cheap, abusive gracers. Here goes our bad gracers. Are you with me? Here goes the abusers, here goes the uh, distorters, here goes the perverters. Not of works, lest any man should boast. See, their works ain't got nothing to do with it. I don't have to do anything. Wrong. Do not abuse the, 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 this verse, especially concerning works. 
Don't abuse this verse or mistranslate it or take it out of its context because it says not of works. So see, I got this grace not of works, so man, I'm free to go. Ah, no, 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 no. If you're there in that grace, then turn to Ephesians. If you're not there, go back to it right quick. All right, everybody get to Ephesians quickly. We've got to hurry now. I'm running out of time. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, are you there? Say amen. All right, here we go. Ephesians chapter 2, we read verses 8 and 9, right? All right, but let's not stop there. Let's look at verse 10. For we are His... Talk to me, church. For we are His... When I stop, you speak. Created in Christ Jesus unto... Oh, my goodness. See, don't take that context out of context and say, see, not of works. No, no. We're His workmanship created unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What? We're to walk in good works. Hello? Now, you, I'm not, we don't have time to go through it. But I want you to understand it. You need to go over to James chapter 2. Write it down there under, under Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And, and there next to that verse or whatever. Put a cross-reference down. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Our brother James, who's the half-brother of our Lord, that wrote the first book in the New Testament, which is the book of James. All right, five wonderful little chapters about Christian practical living. That's what the book of James is about, all right? And it was written to, to our brethren, Jewish brethren, and Christian believers, Gentile believers that were scattered out all around the world due to persecution and everything, all right? And he writes there in chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, he discusses this whole matter about faith and works. Are you with me? See, don't confuse that verse and take it out of context. You see, there's not by works. We're not talking about your We're talking about your salvation. You're saved by faith, through faith, by grace, through faith. It's not of yourselves, and it's not of your works. There's not enough work you can do. You could work from now till kingdom come. What work would you do? Who would tell you what work to do? How long were you to do the work? What kind of work were you to do? When you retire from the work? Or is there a retirement? I mean, that, that scenario can go on and on. That's why it's not by works. Christ did all the work on Calvary for us. When he said, to tell us die, it is finished. It's paid in full. But now that I'm saved, I work. God has created me for good works, and He's ordained that I walk in them, live in them, do them. You see, Sunday school, bride of Christ, all right, thank you, amen, praise the Lord. Always get a little extra in there, right, amen. So you can read James, and James explains it and goes through it very carefully and clearly with that. We don't have time to go into that. That's another message. So there's a necessity of obedience in the Scripture. Amen? Let's just like a look at a few of them real quickly like here. John 3.36. There's a necessity of obedience. Notice what he said. He that believeth. That's obedience. You've got to do something. You've got to believe. What do you believe? You believe on the Son of God hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Acts 6, 7. And the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of priests were, talk to me, obedient to the faith. Romans 5, 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 5, 9, And being made perfect, complete, mature, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hello? You see, we need to have an understanding. Good grace will give us an understanding of obedience to God. Secondly, there notice, not only the necessity of obedience in the Scriptures, but the relationship between faith and obedience. The relationship. And again, James covers that very clearly in James chapter 2, 14 through 26. You read it and go, go home and don't read it fast because you'll get all tongue-tied. All right? The relationship between faith and obedience. Matthew 3, verses 8 and 10. You say, how come so much Scripture? Because it's what counts is what the Scripture says, not what I say. Amen. We come here, we're going to read the Word of God. We're going to look in the Word of God. We're going to study the Word of God. Because why? This is B in Baptist. Biblical authority. 
Hello, church? We go by biblical authority. Amen? Amen. All right. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 3, verse 8 and verse 10. Bring forth, therefore, what? Bring forth. That's an action verb there. Something you have to do. Fruits meet for, ah, repentance. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. Everybody got that? Hope you understand that. Go back to James 2, 14 through 26 again. So in other words, fruit on a tree, church, is what he's saying here, does not produce life. It proves life. Are you with me? Got an apple tree out here. And then CJ says, well, Pastor, that's a good-looking apple tree, but there are no apples on it. Well, wait a minute. Give me a minute. I run down here to Publix. I grab a bushel. I come back, and I, I tow apples all over the tree on those branches. I said, look at it, man. Look at all those apples. And he says, yeah, but that, that, those limbs, those branches are dead. They didn't produce that fruit. See, if you and I aren't producing fruit, we're dead. But we produce fruit because we are alive. It proves we have life. Okay, are, are you with me on this? Faith and works. Martin Luther said, faith alone saves. Can everybody agree with that? But saving faith is never alone. That's what James talks about in chapter 2. You go read it, okay? So where there is genuine faith, there will be genuine fruit. Where there is no fruit, there is no faith. Hello? So you see, there has to be a, an understanding of obedience. All right, fourthly, the fourth ingredient, the fourth component is, as we find here, good grace impacts our understanding of rewards. Hello, of rewards. How many of you want rewards? Amen. How many of you like rewards? Amen. Amen? Well, let's take a look at it real quickly here, what time we have remaining here. Fourthly, our understanding of rewards. Good grace is going to give us an understanding of that. Bad grace isn't. Because if you want to hang on to bad grace and cheap grace, you're not getting any rewards. Right. Hello, you can't go out here and live in sin and live like the devil. Boy, did you hear that, Ted? Look at that thing just, I mean, it took off again. So is this, this microphone too? What is going on? Oh, impacts rewards. And we find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And so since you don't have the verse down there, turn to it. Turn back just a few pages from Ephesians and get back to 2 Corinthians. It's right there, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Quickly hurry. Grace impacts our understanding of rewards. Okay? Are you with me? Say Amen. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. 9 and 10. Here we go. Wherefore, we, what? What's another word for labor? Work. We labor, whether present or absent, we are accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that what? That everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that which he has done, whether it good or or bad. He says we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and every one of us will give an account of ourselves. I'm not accounting for Pat and he's not accounting for me. And by the way, I'm glad God did that because there'll be some of those out here that want to practice cheap grace, perverted grace, abusing grace. They're not getting any rewards. So I'm glad I'm going to stand before the Lord for me, not you. Amen. See, the commander there, though, he knows what I'm talking about. We're going to have rewards in this life. Amen? How many want rewards in this life? Amen. Anybody want some rewards? Amen. And get out and go to work. Amen. Don't work for the city or the county or the state. Work for Jesus. Amen. Okay? Amen. We're going to get rewards in this life. Look at 1 Peter 3.12 and Malachi 3, 9 and 10. Look what 1 Peter 3.12 says. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their prayers. That's a reward. You want your prayers heard and answered? Then you need to live a righteous life. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil, or that those that disobey, or those that are not living right, righteous. Those that are using their grace card to sin. Hello? 
Hearing our prayers and answering them. Man, that's a wonderful reward in this life. What does Luke 6.38 say? It says give. Look up here at me now. The Bible says give. And it shall be. It shall be. That's a promise. It shall be given unto you. Pressed down. Shaking together. And running over. Jesus was looking at that crowd that day and telling those boys with all their turbans on them and everything. And he said, look at that. Look at them going by with the weed grain baskets and everything. He said, I'm telling you, if you will give to God, I'm telling you, he's going to give it back to you. He's going to take that basket of grain and he's going to shake it and shake it. And as he keeps shaking it, what happens? It goes and settles and settles till finally it gets to the top and it begins to overflow. He says, you give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaking together, running over, shall men give to your bosom. I'm telling you, quit robbing God. Amen. You want a blessing today, you start giving. It gets quiet when you talk about that, and George, you know that? Isn't it interesting? God will save our souls from hell, and we don't have a problem with that, but we won't give God our pocketbook. God, you can have every area of my life but my wallet. Oh, my goodness. But that's a promise. That's a reward. Oh, here's another one. I said, oh, no, here, no, the preacher's going to go after. Here we go, Malachi 3. I know. Verses 9 and 10. We're talking about a reward today. Ye are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Talking to Israel. And they asked the question they had in the beginning of verse 8. They said, God, wherein have we robbed you? And God says, you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. What? You have robbed me in tithes and offerings. Okay, are you there? Amen. So bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that's the church today, that there may be meat, provisions in my house. And prove me. The only time in all the Word of God that God says, you can put me to the test. You can test me. And see herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. When you use the phrase Lord of hosts, that means the Lord of all of heaven's army. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough for you to receive it. To receive it, that phrase means it will be overflowing. You want to know why a lot of believers are not living in the blessing of overflowing? You want to know why the believers don't have it financially? Because you're robbing God. No, you know I love you, but you cannot give God. Now, don't go in there and say, okay, preacher, here we go again. There you go. Let me remind you, Pastor. That was under the law of the Old Testament. Really? Hmm. Let's see. If I recall, when we studied Abraham, we found Abraham had a big battle, and he won the battle. And as he was on the way back, he met a king by the name of Melchizedek, who we happen to call the pre-incarnate Christ, we believe. We call it Christopathy in theology. It's a pre-appearance of Christ. And the Bible says that Abraham gave him a tithe, of that battle, a tenth of all that battle. Because he's the high priest. Christ is our high priest. Amen. Come on, church. Amen. And by the way, just to help you out a little bit, he did that 400 years before the law was ever written. Amen. And you say, well, does it go in the New Testament? Yes, because they were asking Jesus about it. And Jesus said, that you have ought to have done. In other words, Jesus was saying, that's the least you could do, was to give the tithe. Now, if you're not experiencing the windows of heaven and the overflowing of blessings, it's because maybe because you're robbing God. And it could be because you're using, misusing, and misabusing, and mistreating, and perverting, and, and, and all everything of God's amazing grace with your grace card, and you're wasting all your substance on the world, and the things of the world, and the ways of the world. Lord, have mercy. So you be careful because it's going to get loud. And see, the devil doesn't. See, the devil doesn't want you to give to God's work. If you want a blessing, you start giving to God. And you say, well, I can't, I can't afford to tithe. No, you can't afford not to tithe. Amen. Let me tell you that right now. Amen. Oh, my goodness. But we've got to finish. I've got to go. And it's only 5 minutes to 12. But my TV clock went out. So how many want some rewards in this life? Amen. Then you need to have an understanding of it. Amen. And good grace will give you an understanding of the rewards that God has for you now. And guess what? He got some rewards for you later on, CJ. In glory. Yeah? Well, let's take a look at it. How about in the next life? And we read that in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. For we labor that whether present or absent, that we may be accepted. That word means pleasing to him. For we must. Now, here's the motivation. 
That's for we must. Always don't miss the musses in the Word of God when it says for must, we must, we must. It's very important. Okay, here's the motivation of why. Because we're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and every one of us may receive the things done in his body according to that which he had done, whether good or bad. Are you with me? We got rewards awaiting for us, not only now, but in glory. And here's one of my favorite ones. How many believe Jesus is coming? Well, in Revelation chapter 22, and in verse number 12, we have three triads in there in the verses, starting at verse number 7. In verse number 6 and 22, 6, it says that these things must shortly must be done and are at hand. Well, what is? The very next verse, verse uh, verse uh, 7, Behold, he cometh in the clouds. Behold, I come quickly. Then we get to verse 12. Behold, I come quickly. The word behold means to look and see. The word quickly is suddenly by surprise, without delay. Amen. For the Son of Man cometh in an hour that you think not. And in verse 12, he says, Behold, look and see, I come quickly, and my reward... My what? And my reward is with me to give to every man according to his work. And in verse 21, he says, surely, surely, CJ, I come quickly. Thirteen verses, triplets, triads, we call them. Wants to get the point apart. But you see, the motivation behind all of of our giving is the fact we're going to stand before God one day. But the other motivation is the fact He's going to reward me. I'm looking forward to that. And all those that are living for Him and serving Him and using your grace right like you should be, not misusing it, not abusing it, not mistreating it, not perverting it, God's got some wonderful things for you now and in time to come. You talk about the rewards. Well, read the, three let, read the seven letters to the churches of, of, of the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation. He closes out every letter. He says, to him that overcometh, I will give. To him that overcometh, I will give. Now, he talks about coming. He says, be of good cheer. Remember when Jesus told his disciples, be of good cheer. In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome. What's he overcome? I have overcome the world. That's what he said. What is the world? 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For the love of the world is not of the Father, but of the world. And here they are. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of love, a pride of life or of the world. And they're going to pass away. So he says to the seven churches, to us, the seventh church, Laodicean church, to him that overcometh. What do we overcome? The flesh. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Because that is of the world. That's what we're to overcome. I will give. I will give. There are 21 blessings in those seven letters. You can go read them later that God's going to give to you. They're, They're fantastic. And they're awesome. And you may say, well, man, I'm going to be in heaven. What do I need all those rewards for? Well, you see, you've got to study them a little bit. The Bible says that God's going to give us five crowns. You can get four of them. I get the fifth one as the crown of glory as the pastor that feeds the flock. I pray that I do, and I have the right attitude with what I'm doing up here, that I can get that crown of glory. Well, so what do you want them for? Because when I get to glory, I'm going to stand before him, and he's going to give me five crowns. I hope. I earn all five of them, CJ. I'll be happy with one, but I'd like to have five. That word crown is translated in the Greek a royal badge of honor. Okay, you got that? That's what we do with our heroes in the war. We, we put on them the Congressional Medal of Honor. We're going to get a royal badge of honor. And you say, man, we want all those things for. We're going to look like five-star general with all this cabbage hanging on our robe. You know, the white, all this weight. But you see, when you get to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, the Bible says that we, the saints of God, are bowing at his feet and we are casting our crowns, our stephanos, not the diadem, 
Different word there, the Stephanos crowns. That's the victor's crown because we've overcome the world. And we're going to cast our royal badges, our crowns, at his feet. And we're going to crown him the king of glory and the king of kings. And when we go to the coronation day of the king, I don't want to be a spectator. I want to be a participant. The choice is yours. It's worth serving Christ. Now, I know I'm over time. It's only 12 up, straight up. My editor will do a good job. She keeps telling me. And I keep telling them there, if you're missing it, come on out and be with us, and you won't miss it. Amen. Amen. So you see, understanding good grace, those four components will help us in our Christian life as we understand sin, obedience, rewards. Somebody help me with the other one. Repentance. Thank you, Jerry. See, I knew it, but I just want to see if he knew it. <laughs> and Grace, folks, by all means, I beg you in Jesus' name, do not go out and just live like the devil and act like the devil, think like the devil, and the world and everything has got in it. Because after all, I'm saved by grace. I want to tell you something. If you live that way, and you are truly saved and born again, that is an insult to God. That is an insult to what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. We don't have a cheap grace. So if you're not here, you're here with us, you're listening, you're watching, you've never been saved. You've never experienced, you've never been a recipient of God's amazing grace. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that right now. We're not going to delay it. My time's up. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray with me. It's not the prayer that saves you indirectly. Those are words, communication with God. What's going to save you is putting your faith and trust in the person, the person of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary for you. You've heard it in the message already. Now, my dear friend, if, if, if God is speaking to your heart and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, you need to experience, you need to become a recipient of God's wonderful, amazing grace by receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior because you're going to be saved through faith and you're going to get this wonderful gift given to you called the grace of of God. If you so desire that right now, I want you to pray with me. Pray this. Dear God, that's right. Go ahead. I confess that I'm, you're the, I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord in heaven. You confess that's what the Bible says. If we confess our, confess with our mouth, the Lord. I confess that I'm a sinner and I sinned against you in heaven and I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me and he will, my friend, he will. I do now believe in my heart, that's faith, trusting, that Jesus died on the cross just for me. He took my place. He paid my sin debt that day. And I believe that with all my heart. I believe now that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, the Bible. And so right now, by faith, I do call upon you, Lord, and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior. Take me to heaven someday when I die. And I pray this simple little prayer in faith believing in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you for praying with us. We'd love to hear from you. Write us, call us, email us. It's all on the screen there. We'll send you some literature now that you're saved. What next? You can get a copy of this message, whatever you'd like. But the main thing is you've trusted Christ. God bless you for that. We love you. God loves you. Now live for him and serve him until Jesus comes. All right, will you do that? And then my dear Christian friend, if you're watching by television, the internet, YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, the radio, oh, please, do not, do not, mistreat, misuse, abuse, distort, or pervert God's amazing 
grace. And if you have, ask him to forgive you right now. Go ahead, ask him to forgive you and help you to have a change of mind about this wonderful gift of grace. Now may the Lord bless all of you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you as we go off the air. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.